Okay, folks, sorry for the late start. I had some technical problems when I arrived, but uh, I fixed my USB hub, so hubba lubba dub dub. All right, I forgot to show you something really cool last time we spoke about lunar range finding retroreflection. And last night I gave a public lecture at the Mornington Astronomical Society, which um, led me to learn a bit more about these things. So I'm going to show you what I forgot and show you something I learned since we last spoke. This was the uh, device that the Apollo 15 astronauts left on the moon. And this is what we learn about the moon from these amazing measurements. We can detect it to a few millimeters in precision. It teaches us about Einstein's equivalence principle because we can measure the acceleration on the moon and the earth from the sun and see if they're the same. Indeed they are, two better than one part in a trillion. We also know from the wobble that the moon has a liquid core and uh, we can even tell things about how the core interacts and why it's losing energy. Which reminds me that the, the moon is just a Cadbury cream egg. Now, I don't think there are any conspira moon conspiracy theorists in the audience. Are you a moon conspiracy theorist? You must be, because you're not listening. But if there are moon conspiracy theorists, you might enjoy these films, Operation Avalanche and Moonwalkers, which is a fun riff on the trope of Stanley Kubrick making a film that mimicked or replaced the moon landing. For the conspiracy theorists, sending photons to the moon and seeing them arrive back with our eyes or single photon detectors probably isn't enough to convince you that we went to the moon. There's better evidence. We can just look at the moon itself. How do we do it? We use the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This thing was sent up in 2009. It was supposed to go for two years, but it's still going. And it orbits the moon at a height of 50 kilometers. So it's whizzing around really close to the moon. And it takes these really impressive um, satellite photographs using this device. It's a high numerical aperture camera, shown here for scale with a hammer and a Swiss Army knife, and a wide angle camera as well. So what does this thing do? Let's have a look. You can go to the Google Maps for the moon. It's um, target.lroc.asu.edu. If you type in retro to the search bar here and click find, you'll find the Apollo 15 landing site. So we can just um, simply zoom in on this and see what um, the astronauts left. So right now we've got about 10 kilometers across on this bar down here, 125 meters per pixel. We're looking at a space that's sort of the Melbourne metropolitan area, about 200 k's across. Zooming in, zooming in quite a lot further, we get down to this stunning resolution. Now four meters per pixel, now one meter per pixel. Let's go a little bit further. We've now got a resolution of 50 centimeters per pixel. For those of you that haven't seen this picture before, what features do you notice about this image? There's tracks. Yeah, what are the tracks from? The rover, yeah. There was no valet service. They couldn't bring their car back with them. This is just them doing circle work on the lunar surface and leaving their car there. There's their car. It's left up there. So everything that the astronauts left, cars, mirrors, their poo, it's all up there for us to see with sufficiently high resolution. You can't really make out everything from this picture. There's a higher resolution version which is annotated and it's shown here. Indeed, we see the, um, the rover vehicle, the descent stage, and this tiny little white pixel, that's the suitcase of mirrors. That's what sends us those photons back with a loss rate of 10 to the 18, but it sends them back to us anyway. This isn't the only reflector on the moon, there's heaps. There's the reflectors left from Apollo 11, Apollo 14, Apollo 15, and two Russian missions as well. And in particular, Lunokhod 1 is a fascinating story. This is it. It is a suitcase of mirrors on the back of a rover. It drove around the lunar surface for about six months, covering tens of kilometers, which is pretty impressive compared to the other rovers that have been to the moon. And then we lost it. It had a premature shutdown, and it was missing for about 40 years. So we um, didn't know where it was. We couldn't find it with the lunar rangefinder. But someone figured that we can just use LROC, the reconnaissance orbiter camera, to find it playing a very, very top, uh, arduous game of Where's Wally. And that's what they did. They looked, scoured images in a five kilometer radius of where the last known coordinates were, and they saw this thing. This thing isn't too dissimilar from other stuff on the moon like rocks, but what's the smoking gun here that this is something that humans put up there? Joe. Yeah. 
The track, yeah, again, the track is the smoking gun. That uh, This is something that we put up there, and indeed, in 2009, this imagery revealed the missing Lunokhod 1 after 40 years. Super cool. Two years later, we got better imagery, so pay attention to the top right-hand corner. And you can really see now different bits of the rover, including its satellite dish. Let's zoom in. There it is, the missing Lunokhod 1. This was a great find. The other cool thing is any one of us could have done it. It was only a couple of years ago. It was just playing Where's Wally. This is an example of uh, some, an Easter egg of the universe hiding in plain sight for 40 years and someone going, let's find it. This is a picture that L Rock took by facing its camera the other direction and looking at Earth. The shadow is from the uh, solar eclipse, which happened a few weeks ago. This is a truly remarkable device. And it's not just um, an intellectual curiosity that I'm telling you about this. Uh, the Lunar COD 1 is actually super useful for making those measurements of the lunar libration cycle. Uh, and in fact, it's the most um, efficient of ranging reflectors that sends photons back to us. It doesn't have as much dust on it as the other ones. It doesn't heat up from the sun's rays as much as the other ones. So it turned out to be quite a boon. Yeah, I noticed that last night too. I think so. I mean, it kind of makes sense because the moon's black and white. Um, don't know why. I guess it decreases the payload. Uh, they can probably they probably had a trade-off between color channels. Yep, less sensors. They had a trade-off between color channels and resolution, maybe. So that's what the Earth looks like in black and white during a solar eclipse. Okay, back to our regular programming. Last time we looked at this envelope function for Gaussian beams, how real beams of light propagate. And we found that um, we could decompose it as a, uh, we could write it as a uh, spherical wave with a complex radius of curvature Q. Uh, in doing so, we substituted that into the praxial equation and got these two simple equations, no longer complicated DEs with multiple spatial derivatives, now just DEs in Z for these two parameters, Q, the complex radius of curvature, and P, some mystery function we're going to look at today. We went through about 15 minutes of um, algebra. It took about a page. We went from about 115 to 130. I've sped up this video by a factor of 60, so we get one minute per second. Now, that's if you were stuck on a desert island with a Surface Pro 4 and a lot of time, you'd be able to do that. But we can do a lot better than that. I'm now going to repeat that derivation in hopefully under five minutes in Mathematica. So if you've got a stopwatch, now's the time to pull it out. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is define a function um, u of x, y, and z. Hello. Let's go back to the old-fashioned way. Oh, Mathematica, don't do this to me. It's one of those tech days. I'm going to switch over to my backup machine so as not to... Um, get beaten by the clock here, but now I've really got my work cut out for me if I'm going to get this done in time. Oh, total tech fail. Sorry, guys. And my backup machine is dead, so this is not going well. I may have to show you the um, Mathematica demonstration next time. I'll give it one more second. I'm probably up to five minutes already. It's only been a minute. That's great. I feel much better now. Not a lot better, though. OK, let's try this um, one more time. Oh, dear. That's a bit sad. So I'm going to go back to the, um, the lecture instead, and um, I'll continue that derivation uh, later in the lecture. <clears throat> so um, what we're going to do instead is move on to um, where we were. Uh, halfway through last lecture, which was to um, show what the effect or the consequence of making a complex radius of curvature was.
All right. So we um, got to this point where we could uh, write down a function q, which had a real part and an imaginary part. We decided to write it in a funny way, which was to say, instead of um, writing the real part and imaginary part as a plus ib, we're going to write it as the reciprocal of q is equal to the reciprocal of some real part uh, plus some function which depends on the waste. Now, in doing that, we substitute into the um, function u, and we saw the benefit of making this uh, complex radius of curvature. It's what recovered um, the spherical wave with a real radius of curvature, which depends on z. And it also made our solutions no longer absurd. They have some spatial dependence, and this is the amplitude profile, uh, which gives us this nice spot size. There was this mystery function p. What does that do? Well, we'll get to that in a second. But the waste function z looks like this when we plot it. Uh, and it has the following properties. The spot size or radius of the transverse amplitude profile um, was characterized by a minimum w naught. And we also saw at the waist that the wave fronts were completely planar. So these were the results. There was a characteristic length zr over which the um, beam changes. It depends on how small you make the beam. And these were the two results that I just asserted last time without showing you uh, how to find. So now we're going to actually um, and go through and, uh, and do that derivation. So in the notes, there's this exercise uh, that I'd like you to try, or I'd like you to try um, the following bit of. But I'm going to do the bit now that shows you how the width varies as a function of z. And we remember we had this simple equation for q which was um, qz prime equals 1. This is like the simplest differential equation you've ever seen. We know what the solution for this is. We just integrate both sides. And it's equal to z plus some constant. Remember, we have to have, have that constant of integration q0. Uh, remember that q0 can be a complex number because q is a complex radius of curvature. Now, the um, way we wrote down the real parts and imaginary parts of q were like this. And we said that the radius of curvature to R and the waste were going to be real numbers. So recall that um, at the beam waste, it's characterized by two things. A spot size W, which we just conveniently called W naught. And the curvature, at the origin, went to infinity. So we had planar wave fronts at the beam waste. We can just substitute these into the expression for 1 on q and see what we get. 1 on q naught, that was our integration constant, is equal to 1 on infinity revoking my mathematics license and substituting in k omega naught squared. We know what k is. <clears throat> it's the wave number of this monochromatic field. It's 2 pi on lambda. So if we rewrite this um, second term of the uh, expansion here, we're going to get uh, 2i divided by 2 pi over lambda times w naught squared. The twos cancel. I have to bring the lambda on top, and I get a lambda on pi w naught squared. If you've been paying attention, you'll notice that this is the characteristic scale over which the wave field changes. It's the Rayleigh range, or the reciprocal of the Rayleigh range. I missed a factor of i there. So it's just i on z of r because z of r was defined as pi times omega naught squared, sorry, w naught squared on lambda. So that means that we know this integration constant now. We know what q naught is. It's equal to uh, z r divided by i, otherwise known as negative i z r. <clears throat> this means that we've got the entire solution for the complex radius of curvature. Q of z 
equals to z minus i z of r. It might seem like our job is done. We've got this complete information about the wave field's complex radius of curvature q, um, and it's a really simple function. At the origin, it's purely imaginary, and as we propagate, it has a real part that grows with z. That, and the effect of that real part is to change both the real radius of curvature and the beam size. But actually getting those real radius of curvature and beam size from this expression uh, is not so trivial or not so obvious, uh, so I'll explain how we do it now. So, you notice from the expression for uh, 1 on Q that 1 on R is the real part of Q to the power of minus 1. <clears throat> and the second term in the uh, real imaginary expansion of 1 on Q tells us that 2i on K W of Z squared is equal to the imaginary part. I'm sorry, I always do this with imaginary numbers. 2 on k w of z squared is equal to the imaginary part of q of z to the minus 1. OK, so that means we can solve these equations for, um, for the radius of curvature r and the uh, beam radius w. Substituting in what we know about k being uh, the wave number 2 pi on lambda. Take a look at this expression. Whoops. It's got to do with finding the imaginary part of a complex numbers reciprocal finding the real part of a complex numbers reciprocal, and then taking the reciprocal of that. The last bit's easy, but um, finding the real and imaginary parts of a, num of a complex numbers um, reciprocal is perhaps not so obvious. So what do we know how to do? Well, we know um, how to do things like take the real part of Z, sorry, take the real part of Q. That bit's easy. It's Z. We know how to take the imaginary part of Q. That's also really easy. It's negative ZR. And we also know how to take the modulus of Q. That's fill 2 E3. No, we're in E2, right? Yeah. OK. So we have to figure out how to go from these factoids to something about the real and imaginary part of the reciprocal of Q. And to do that, we're going to need um, two identities about complex numbers. This is stuff that you could totally do in your sleep, but you've probably never seen before, so we're going to um, go through it by hand. Let's just consider some general complex number A. <clears throat> we're going to write it in polar form. So that's its modulus times some complex phasor, where theta is a real number and A is a complex number. We want to know stuff about the inverse of A. So let's write that down in polar, co uh, polar form as well. The amplitude of this inverse is just 1 on the modulus of A. And it also has a complex phasor which we just get from using index notation. It's e to the negative i theta. Now we're going to expand that complex phasor in trigonometric form. And here we just use some simple facts about cos and sine. <clears throat> 
cos of negative theta is theta, because it's an even function. And sine of negative theta is negative sine theta, because it's an odd function of theta. This is now looking like something we can use to express uh, the real and imaginary parts of a to the minus 1 in terms of the real and imaginary parts of a. So let's go ahead and calculate the real part of a to the minus 1 in terms of those things. You can see that the real part of a to the minus 1 is um, this inverse modulus times uh, cosine of theta. Cosine of theta, that is related to the real part of A, but it's not exactly the real part of A. It can only be as big as 1, or, and as small as minus 1, so recall that cos of theta is the real part of A divided by its modulus. What does that give us? That gives us this relationship that comprises our first identity. Okay, that's factoid 1. Factoid 2 is about the imaginary part of the reciprocal of A. Again, identifying um, the second half of that line above as the imaginary part. So we've got negative sine theta. This too is related to the imaginary part of A, uh, and we have to perform the same trick. Thanks so much, Phil. Absolute legend. Let's give it up for Phil. Yeah. Okay. So we perform the same trick, identifying that sine of theta is simply the imaginary part of A divided by A, or modulus of A, and we get a very similar identity. relating the imaginary part of 1 on A to the imaginary part of A. OK. We can straight away use the fact um, that we've got these identities to figure out W of Z and R of Z now. So we're going to recall the fact that I'll just write some results down from the previous page so I don't have to swap between them. Q of Z was Z minus I Z R. Real part of Q is z, imaginary part of q is negative zr, and the modulus of q is the square root of z squared plus zr squared. Now it's time to plug and chug. Here's where we're going to use the blue identity. The real part, of, uh, a real part of Q to the power of minus 1 is this. We have to take the inverse of that. That's pretty simple. It's worth dividing, um, out, the bracket, uh, dividing out this um, sum here because uh, the first term is, is really, really simple. It is just z squared on z, which is z, plus zr squared on z. Time for a sanity check. Remember, you can always check your work. There are ways you can find out whether I've screwed this up or at least might have screwed this up. The first thing I'm going to do is check for units. The real radius of curvature must be a length, so I'm going to check that all those units, all those terms have the correct uh, correct units. Indeed, z is a length, z squared on z is also a length. We're going to find out whether this is physical in just a moment. Now let's figure out what q is. Sorry, the, the width is. From the last page, we had w of z squared was equal to lambda on pi times this imaginary part. Again, plugging and chugging. something to the power of minus 1. That something is the purple term from the identity. So it's negative times the imaginary part of Q. Again, divided by the modulus squared. 
Here we're going to get uh, the negative terms cancelling. And I may as well straight away take this um, uh, inverse. Okay, the Rayleigh range depends on lambda. I haven't um, expressed that in terms of the waste W naught and lambda yet, but I'm going to do something else, which is to write lambda in terms of the Rayleigh range. So let's remember how to do that. The Rayleigh range is just pi omega naught squared over lambda. So uh, lambda is equal to pi w naught squared on zr. The pi's are going to cancel. And when I multiply this through, I'm going to get uh, a common factor of ZR squared. So to make this less unwieldy, let's divide through by ZR squared and we'll get 1 plus Z on ZR all squared. This allows us to write down what W of Z is. which is the same result that um, was in the notes. So we've now shown exactly uh, what these two things are. The real radius of curvature as a function of z and how big the beam is as a function of z. All right. At this point, we've done the hard work. We've taken our derivation of these two beam parameters. Uh, what do we do? We've got equations. What do we do with equations? What are, they, what are they good for if we can't see them, right? We have to do something with them. Let's play with them. Equations are our toys. Equations are our friends. So we derived um, uh, this. Let's actually go ahead and start plotting them now. And for this, I'm going to switch over to my other computer, and we'll start the clock again on my derivation. So please reset your stopwatches. Okay, my time starts now. So I'm going to start with this function u of x, y, and z. It was the um, general form of a uh, spherical wave with a weird term i, p of z plus this um, familiar complex radius of curvature. The um, complex radius of curvature was Q of Z. Here I've clearly made a problem with my, um, my units uh, because I've got length squared on length. So I have to remember that this is actually um, 2i on k. All right. Now I'm going to um, go ahead and figure out, oh, no, it's k, sorry. I k of the quadratic term divided by 2, which we get from that series expansion. Now I'm going to calculate the transverse Laplacian. In Mathematica, that's taking second derivatives of the function u first with respect to x. So d of u of x, y, z. And the way I tell Mathematica that I want the partial derivative with respect to x is with this tuple. This tuple does two things. It says the derivative is with respect to x, and I want the second order one. That looks quite wild, and we're going to make it twice as wild by adding to that the second derivative with respect to u. This looks like a really bad idea at this point because things are pretty messy. They're even worse than what I had um, on paper. I'm going to call this praxial 1 because we expanded the praxial equation in terms of uh, two terms, 1 and 2. Um, but I'm going to divide this whole thing 
by that common term we wrote down, which was, I think, 2ik u of x, y, z. Russ, what are you doing? This is only getting worse. It's time to ask Mathematica to make this simpler. Bam, we have something now which is in terms of x, y, and q. Very good. Let's redefine that as praxial 1. That's the first half of the praxial equation. Now let's have a go at praxial 2. This was 2ik times the partial derivative of u of x, y, z once with respect to z. Again, this doesn't look so helpful, but remember we, we divided by uh, 2i times k times u of x, y, z. Didn't have to simplify that at all. So let's redefine that as praxial 2. And now we just add the two bits together and demand that they be 0. It's an equation. I'm going to tell Mathematica it's an equation with a double equal sign. I don't want to assign those things to equal 0. I want to tell Mathematica that they must equal 0 by virtue of an equality. All right. So what did we do at this point? Well, we made a substitution. We made a substitution that whenever we saw an x squared plus y squared, we're going to call that uh, r squared. We did that in our heads by pattern matching. Mathematica is great at pat pattern matching, and, and it's all symbolic algebra is. So when we write it this way, we get the equation which is quadratic in R. This is what we used to derive equations for uh, P and Q. We did it by looking at the coefficients of the quadratic equation. I can get these coefficients by using the Mathematica function coefficient list. If you're ever unsure about how to use a Mathematica function, select it and press F1. Doing so takes my polynomial, takes the variable that I've uh, got a polynomial in, and just gives me the list of coefficients. So magically, we can ask for those coefficients in this polynomial of R by typing paraxial of R. And it gives us three coefficients. It's identified that it's a quadratic. And I'll put this into table form so you can see it better. Hmm. Coefficient, that's only one. I wonder why that is. Coefficient list, paraxial, R. Haha. -ha. Let's take rid of the zero. That's better. So I have to wait and set the individual coefficients to zero when I want to make my equality. So I'm going to take um, note of the fact that there's a linear term which we got by inspection last time. The, sorry, the uh, constant term which we got by inspection. There's no linear term in R, so its coefficient is zero in that polynomial. And the bit that is proportional to r squared is the bottom bit. And we had this magical trick we could do, which was to set all those coefficients to zero. If I tell Mathematica to set those coefficients to zero, it tries to set that list to zero. That's no good. We want to tell Mathematica that all these things should be zero. So we use the function thread. And it goes through and individually applies zero to each of those expressions. The middle one's trivial. Zero equals zero. Even Mathematica knows that's true. And we're going to solve for the rest of them. So we're going to um, try and solve this now uh, for two variables, uh, p and um, how are we, do, are we going to do that, actually? How did we do it by hand? Uh, actually, we just simplified it. This was it. We wanted to get two differential equations relating p and q. And we just simplified it based on a couple of things. We had to tell Mathematica that um, k was bigger than 0, and also that q is never 0. And that's it. So we got our um, reduced equations in this form, and I'll put them in table form so you can see and stop the clock. How did I go? Six minutes. Six minutes. All right. Uh, I took my time and explained things a bit more carefully. Hopefully, that was worth the extra minute. So these are the. Um, two equations we got. The second one we're going to ignore because it's trivial. Uh, this one told us about uh, the magical function p. The last one is something we just used to derive the Gaussian beam size and the um, uh, complex radius of curvature, giving us a real radius of curvature. All right, so now I'm going to actually plot these things because it's pointless just to blindly stare at equations. We need to visualize them. To do this, um, I'm going to define my um, my Rayleigh range is the first function. 
What does it depend on? It depends on the minimum spot size, W0, and the wavelength. For this kind of visualization, I don't want to always have to specify the wavelength, so I'm going to give it a default value of 1. In Mathematica, I do that by using the full colon and telling me that um, I want to use uh, 1 as the default value. So that function is pi times W0 squared over lambda. And we also want to write down what we just found, which was the waste as a function of z. So it depends on how far along the axis you are, the minimum spot size w0, and again, the wavelength, uh, which we're going to set to be equal to 1 by default. So it is w0 times the square root of 1 plus z on zr, all squared. And now we're ready to plot this. Let's plot it for a waste of 1. I'm going to go from like uh, negative 6 to 6. OK, that's the function. Not super physical. We're trying to see what a laser beam looks like or some beam of coherent light. The way we're going to do that and make this a bit more physical is show the top and the bottom of this 1 on E radius. I do that by multiplying by negative 1 and 1. Cool. That's looking kind of like my drawing now, but we can do a little bit better than that. And we're going to go um, filling true. Uh, actually, hmm. Filling axis, we're going to use uh, this syntax here. So now's the time where Mathematica has gotten sufficiently complicated that I should press carriage return to get a new line. Now we've got something that looks a lot like a laser beam. But equations have dials. The parameters of this equation should be considered as knobs we can turn. Let's do one of those by turning the dial of the minimum spot size. So we've got a laser that has that property. Let's do another one that has half the spot size at the origin. We want to see the effect of squeezing light down and what happens when it propagates. So the color isn't different. The plot is. I mean, the wavelength hasn't changed. And we're going to plot these two things on top of each other. This is the physics we talked about last time. If you try and squeeze light down more at its waist, it will expand faster. In fact, after one Rayleigh range here, the blue beam is bigger than the red beam. So squeezing, the, squeezing light makes it diverge faster. This is true of any wave field. Uh, we've just done it for a, a Gaussian laser beam. But this isn't good enough again, because this, animation, this visualization doesn't move. I really like you to get the idea that equations are machines with dials. And if those things are to be considered as dials, we need more than just one parameter and a static plot. So as you can probably guess, I'm now going to use my favorite function and wrap this entire call in a manipulate. So what am I going to vary? I want my dial to be w0. I want it to be the minimum spot size. What do I want it to do? I want it to go from w0 from 0.5 up to 5, over one order of magnitude. I've got to do one more thing here to make this not suck, and that's fix the plot range so that I get a picture which doesn't change in size, only the laser beam does. I better make it red again because my laser's red. And here is our minimum spot of 0.5 expanding quite rapidly. Let's see what happens when we make the spot bigger at the origin the laser beam stops spreading out. So this is why you need a one meter telescope to send a laser beam to the moon, because if you had anything smaller, the beam would be even bigger at the moon, bigger than 15 kilometers, and you'd get even less than 10 to the negative 18 of your original photons back. Squeezing light down makes it expand faster. And a visualization like this takes our very static and hard to pass equations and turns them into something we can actually get a feeling for intuitively uh, and visually. There's one more thing we can do here, which is to think about whether this uh, function is changing shape. So here I had this fixed frame in space, and I just let the laser beam propagate. That's how we experience life uh, if we were to take a laser beam and change its waist size. Let's instead do a scaling of both axes and see if the function is actually changing character. So this time we're going to go from um, three Rayleigh ranges below the um, origin up to three Rayleigh ranges above the origin. And we're going to make our plot size negative 3 omega w0 to 3w0. So this is what the characteristic shape looks like. We're going to do the same animation 
But remember now, we're stretching the horizontal axis and we're stretching the vertical axis in some well-defined uh, way. And nothing happens to the function at all. Just the numbers change on the axis. So what does that tell us? Well, this is completely not how we experience three spatial dimensions. But it does tell us that changing the waste of a light field doesn't really change its character. It just changes the numbers on the axis, how fast it expands. The Gaussian beam looks the same for any scale. Uh, it just has to take into account the fact that it's getting bigger faster. All right. I will now change back to my regular programming. What about this P of Z? This thing I've been um, sort of leading you towards but not telling you about. I won't solve this here today. It's in the notes. But we have to use this equation to get out what P of Z is. Turns out to be a little tricky, even though it looks very innocuous. It has this solution. We can write down the solution for e to the i P of Z as follows. And we get three things out of it. The first one we get is normalization. That's just allowing us to have one beam being brighter than another, one beam having more energy than another. The next bit is a decreasing amplitude. This conserves energy as the beam propagates along Z. This is the, um, the factor that takes the peak intensity and drops it down as you go away from the waste. And finally, there is something a little more exotic, and this is known as the Goy phase shift. Um, we have to remember what arctan looks like to actually know what the Goy phase shift is physically. So let's um, plot this up on the top of the slide here. Arctan goes from negative pi on 2, well below the origin, to pi on 2 for distances that are far from the origin. In other words, as I propagate through the waste, the beam will experience a phase shift of pi. We don't measure phase shifts. We measure intensity. When we stick a detector or our eyes in front of light, we see intensity. We do not see phase. If you ever want to see phase, you have to do an interference experiment. And that's exactly what Goy did in 1890 when he discovered this Goy phase shift. He took a point source uh, and he got these uh, spherical waves bouncing off these mirrors. They interfered here and he saw that before the focus of, of one of these um, point sources and after the focus, he got a different interference pattern telling him that there was a phase shift as you go through focus. It's telling us that real beams of light don't propagate like spherical waves and that that pi phase shift is what you need to describe them. Interestingly, it's related to the uncertainty principle. It's a consequence of, of confining any wave. It doesn't have to be a wave of light. It can be a wave of matter, um, electrons or atoms. Any wave field when brought through focus exhibits this Goy phase shift. Seeing it is quite tricky, though. Turns out that um, your lecturers, your other lecturers, uh, Tim Peterson, uh, Tapio Simula, and Michael Morgan, who I've conveniently left off the end of that slide, they actually um, measured this for an electron matter wave. And they produced this beautiful visualization of the phase shift as the beam went through focus. And that came out a couple of years ago. There's a visual way you can um, view this Goy phase shift, and it's to draw, de draw the uh, wave fronts of a spherical wave and the wave fronts of a Gaussian beam. Here's the result. You can see that um, if the beam's going this way, then at large negative z, the Gaussian wave fronts are pi on 2 out of phase with the spherical ones. And after focus, if you counted all these lines, you'd see that they led the spherical wave by pi on 2. There's a kind of hand wave you can think about this and that is that um, the phase of the wave, how it changes with, with the radius from, the, um, from this origin, tells you which way it's going. And a spherical wave always goes out from the origin, right? A beam goes always in one direction. That means that you necessarily need a phase shift to describe the difference between light propagating as a beam and light propagating out from the origin. So bringing it all together, we write down the final expression for psi, any one component of the electromagnetic field. We had this decreasing amplitude term, the uh, spherical wave front in the, in the praxial approximation, the Goy phase shift, and the amplitude profile. So this is all the physics of a Gaussian beam, and we've done it from Maxwell's equations on some guy's tattoo. <laughs>
This isn't the only solution to the praxial equation. There are heaps. In general, there's an infinite set of Hermite Gaussian functions. They look like this. You can also take linear combinations of them. So if I took a linear combination of these two, which is um, a antinode, two antinodes, one here and one here, and added it to one here and one here, that happens entirely coherently. And I end up getting this um, TEM01 donut mode. Um, it's called a donut mode for obvious reasons. It turns out to be really useful for trapping atoms inside of. So we can use light to trap atoms. And here's a Bose-Einstein condensate in the shape of a donut. This was actually used by um, Professor Chris Helmerson's group um, at NIST in um, the US to show that you can make a superconducting uh, ring out of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And um, it exhibits all the hallmarks of superfluidity and superconductivity in this donut mode. For scale, there's an actual donut, a small one. Finally today, we're going to look at the um, ABCD rule for um, Gaussian beams. I'll just foreshadow this result, but basically um, you can use the ABCD matrices to transform Gaussian beams as they propagate through optics. We didn't actually get to throw away all the stuff we learned in the first few weeks of this course. Uh, we can use the fact that uh, this has some radius of curvature R1 as it enters some optical um, element. We know it's not spherical, but just before the opt optical element, it will have some real radius of curvature R1. And as it exits, it'll have some real radius of curvature R2. From simple geometry, we can see that Y1 is equal to R alpha 1, R1 alpha 1. Y2 is equal to R2 alpha 2. And we know a lot about Y2 in terms of ray optics, which are uh, tangent to these wave fronts. We can write down Y2 as equal to A times Y1 plus B alpha 1. And if we divided that by uh, alpha 2, it is C Y1 plus D alpha 1. That is equal to the ratio, or that is actually equal to the output radius of curvature from the equation above. We would like a mapping that takes us from some input radius of curvature to an output radius of curvature. That will tell us how wave fields trans, uh, transform. So we have to put this expression uh, in terms of uh, R1. And we're going to do that by substituting in what we know about, um, about Y1. So substituting in for Y1 above, I get this expression. And you can see the cool thing about this is that all the angles now cancel. And I'm left with that mapping that I sought in the first place. So this is, an, this is a mapping from R1 to R2. The radius of curvature before some optical element to the radius of curvature afterwards. Quite surprisingly, or quite useful to us, the complex radius of curvature transforms in the exact same way. So this is called the ABCD rule, and it's relating the radius of curvature after an optical element to the radius of curvature beforehand. There's an exercise in the notes and also in Optics Tute 2 that asks you to show that this is actually a well-defined transformation. Well, what would it mean for it to be well-defined? Well, it better have the um, properties of composition that we learned for uh, ray optics, which were that when we had multiple optical elements and combined them together, the result was a ray transfer matrix who was just the product of any two ray transfer matrices. So you'll get to show that in the tute, that this amazing ABCD rule, which recycles all the stuff we learnt in the first few weeks, is actually very useful for uh, Gaussian optics as well. <clears throat> Next time we'll talk about what focusing in the Gaussian uh, optics approach looks like, and we'll see that we're going to recover the physicality of this absurdity predicted by ray optics. Stay tuned for next time. <laughs>